Okay, this is all a big test, so I'm not sure if this will all be working. I think I can see the chat here, so it should be live. And if anyone is watching, could you please put in the chat whether the audio sounds okay, the video is coming through okay. I've not got my good microphone, unfortunately, so I'm running through the webcam one, and hopefully you can't hear my computer whirring in the background too loudly. Um, I'm just going to see if I can check it on my own and then we'll go over the plan of this live stream. I expect it will probably be somewhere between half an hour and an hour. Uh, I've got to head off within an hour so that'll be the max and I don't know what discussions will go like and things like that so it's um, unknown territory put it that way. I'm just going to make sure that, yeah, looks like it's all working. Perfect. Thank you, Lars and Susie. Um, the overall plan for the deep dive of this uh, aero mine and rooftop wind uh, energy as a whole, I've got a few notepad style whiteboard things and the plan is to have a bit of a discussion around them um, what I've tried to do is take people's ideas from the comment section of the video um, and format the live stream around that so it should hopefully answer common questions or at least bring discussion around it I'm not 100% sure what all of the uh, exact answers will be to all of the questions so it's also a great space for people in the comments, uh, in the top chat, or what, the, the chat box, to say what you guys are uh, thinking about uh, the technology. Um, I'm well aware that a lot of you will probably be subject, subject matter experts in areas that I'm not, so it would be really great to have a bit of discussion. Uh, my idea is to liken it something uh, similar so that I do at university uh, in seminars where we will have open discussions. Patrick and Yoris, thank you very much for saying hello. We're up at 23 viewers, which is already a lot more than uh, I thought they'd be. So that's a great start. We'll, we'll get underway. The uh, first section is just an intro and an overview, and we're gonna go back over what was covered in the video with a little bit more detail, um, just, just to set the scene fresh in everyone's mind. Uh, the, the other topics that I've got include the use of the aero mine in, um, in harsh climates, looking at rotating the base of the aero mine, noise and vibration, having it integrated into building designs, and the a bit of the end point that I had in the YouTube video on surface roughness and how much different environments would slow down the wind speed. So Patrick, thanks for the comment. How DIY could this be adopted? Um, my, from reading that question, I, is that to do with uh, how easy would it be to make this DIY um, and have it as home installation? Because I've seen there's a guy on YouTube, I can't remember his name, did a really, is I think working on this as a DIY project. Um, and I imagine this could be a lot simpler to do as a DIY project than some of the more complex normal rotating turbines just because of the moving parts but I'm not I'm not sure so let, let me know if that's what you were thinking okay intro let's get kick kick off with what, what we're uh, looking at so we've got the let me get a pen uh, the aeromine system which is sort of what we were ha had looked at before is using these two aerofoils that are upright uh, to create low pressure region which is this is actually a, a plot of the the speed in inside the aerofoils but if you look on this diagram on the right we can see there's this dark red region and that's basically a low pressure region in the video i used an analogy of like sucking with a straw so this is sort of like your mouth sucking in and it pulls in air back onto the picture on the left, sucks in air and 
drags it through a turbine which rotates, generates electricity um, and uh, we, we have these low pressure regions uh, from, from the aerofoils. So that, that's the high level overview. Let me know if anyone's got any questions as we go. Um, but the advantages that Aeromine and their sort of collaborators talk about, I'll make sure I'm not covering this in my face, is that it's meant to be the benefit of reliability from solar panels and then the uh, consistent power generation of wind turbines combined together. Uh, so they are, so say, the, the sort of holy grail of a renewable energy system. Um, whether that's the case or not is up for debate. It depends a lot on your use cases. Uh, this is some extra uh, photographs that was in some of their technical reports. So they've got this uh, test set up out on, in the field, um, which they've been using to get a lot of these results. And to summarize what, what they've found, they've got um, efficiency values up here, which, oh, that's actually not their, their best one. Efficiency values up at 25%, and um, that is about half what we'd get from a conventional uh, rotating wind turbine. So, one of their benefits, which I didn't speak about as much in the video, one of the benefits that they are thinking would cr create a more cost effective solution for wind turbines is that the the way the wind, um, the aeromine is laid out, it's quite cheap to increase the size of it. Whereas when you've got rotating wind turbines, the bigger you make the, the rotating turbine, the cost isn't linear. It gets way more expensive to have, um, it gets way more expensive to have slightly bigger blades on a wind turbine. Whereas with the aeromine, it's modular and you can stack it up on top of each other. So that comes into this poor quality, I apologise, uh, equation we've got here. So we've got the area, uh, which is this part of the uh, the equation. You, you've got a number of different variables. Air density, coefficient of performance, which is to do with the efficiency of the, the wind turbine, and the wind speed. But this frontal area is the component they're sort of focusing on, trying to get... Um, it to be cheaper to have a larger area wind turbine. That, that, that's one of their key selling points. So that's this sort of area at the front of this. They're, they're saying that be, part of the reason their system can be so cheap is because you can increase the size of this frontal area um, a, lot, a lot more easily. Then here are some extra simulation graphs. Let me know if I'm going too fast over anything or if anyone needs any extra discussion. Uh, this is the first time we're, we're seeing how this goes. Um, the wind turbines they, they've looked at and all the, the setups is having lots of them next to each other on normally the edge of a, a roof. So if you imagine that this is a roof rooftop, normally flat rooftops, they've got a number of them sat on the top there and often they'll have solar panels behind them as well um, I've seen some people talking about how shading might be an issue you're going to get uh, shades on the solar panels so it's hard to tell whether it will be worth putting wind turbines there for a bit of extra power when you might block out some of the solar panels uh, power but I'm, I haven't seen any actual analysis on that the the big sort of selling point that Aeromine are pushing is this cost comparison um, and this was kind of a focal point of the video, the cost comparison um, of it versus solar panels. So they took this map of the USA, they said given the wind speeds at different places you can see how much cheaper it would be than um, other options. 
so or specifically uh, industrial solar the point of the video was to say this doesn't actually account for local um, topologies sort of, of, of the ground um, all right, thanks for the feedback, Susie. Doing great. Just the right speed to think about and assimilate the information. Excellent work. Okay, glad to hear it. Um, the the issue was that the these wind speeds in the map on the right are not accounting for buildings, things like this, which we'll get to later. But what it means is, in reality, although it says the wind speeds in the Midwest are going to be around 7 metres per second, uh, the chances are they'll be a lot slower. You might even end up over here, which means it's more expensive than industrial solar. So that is the sort of intro just to get us familiarized again with it. We've got this wind turbine sucking in external air. There's no moving parts on the actual wind turbine um, and it's, it's all hidden below in the generator. And, and these these airfoils on the top, which are the, these sort of wing shaped bits, are acting very much like a wing to create low pressure and suck in this air. Okay, on that note, I will go to the first topic that was mentioned in the comment section, which I thought was interesting, which is around the area of harsh climates. So, Antarctica was used as an example. Here are some wind turbines there. And the reason um, people said that maybe this aeromine um, system will be better than conventional wind turbines that are spinning are due to the icing effects that you'll get on them. Maybe it's cheaper in maintenance. Uh, and also, as we were talking about forests, buildings, things like this that slow down the wind speed, in Antarctica, the chances are you, you won't have this same surface roughness, um, but a, a conventional wind turbine would also benefit from that as well. So I thought that was an interesting uh, segue to look at how how do these normal wind turbines deal with that. What we've got here is uh, a cross section or a sort of inside view of a wind turbine blade. So there is Generally, in these wind turbines, you'll have a flow of hot air that goes out and then a, a return flow that, that sucks back into the heater. Um, so you end up with internal flows of hot air within the wind turbine blade. And that is what will prevent them from cooling. Obviously, that requires some energy. So, and I don't know what the answer is, but perhaps with Aeromine, you might be able to use less energy to keep the, the system from freezing because it's a lot less of a uh, an issue. That being said, um, the main issue with icing on conventional wind turbines is the blades get heavy, that could cause damage, prevent um, it being able to spin as fast and damage efficiency. On the Aeromine, you can imagine that the because the wind, or yeah, be, because the, the airflow is coming through these, these nozzles. If we had any icing on these nozzles, that's also going to cause an issue. Uh, therefore, maybe we could have some small heaters on, on these nozzles, but it's sort of hard, hard, hard to tell uh, the real costing of all of this, but it's a very interesting use case because you would therefore be heating a smaller area. Um, un un unclear on whether this will really be a commercially viable pursuit but it, it just shows the, the point of different wind turbine designs maybe can benefit different areas better or worse so that was the harsh climates I haven't got if there's any ideas on that in the chat any discussion points uh, let, let me know but that was just a small point I thought was interesting the next one is on the rotating base. This was quite a highly discussed point in the comment section. So as a recap, the Aeromine system, where it's got these sort of aerofoils um, that, the, that the wind can blow over to, to create your low and high pressure 
areas, it's actually in the same way that the wing of a plane or in fact a blade of a wind turbine, in the, the way that that can rotate and still keep air from going over it, it doesn't stall, basically as it rotates the air sticks to it, um, the same thing happens for the aeromine. So what that means is we've got these sort of plus or minus 45 degree areas, uh, so you've got a 90 degree angle here that the wind can come be coming in from and you won't lose any power, which is great if you're in an area where almost all of the wind comes within a 90 degree window. Uh, there were some examples of that in the video, but also there's a lot of examples where that isn't the case. So this is a random windrows I found, which shows that the longer one of these columns, the more the higher percentage of wind comes from that area. Um, and you can see, I mean, if I, if I draw a sort of 90 degree angle there, you're, you're losing a lot of the wind. So there's going to be a lot of places where 90 degrees of, uh, wind alignment or wind misalignment is just not enough. Uh, and in, in one of their reports that I got this graph from, it says that this means there are no, there is no need for your control which is that, that turning of, of the turbine. But I think in, in reality, it would, it would be needed in, in a lot of cases. And the reason they, they're trying to avoid it is again, this whole ethos of reducing cost by reducing the amount of moving parts and reducing the, yeah, the complexity. So as soon as you put a your control in there, you've inevitably got some moving part and, and of course, the, the wind aeromine does have a moving part in the generator, but it's not external, it's somewhere internally placed. So a little bit more of the information on this Coanda effect. So this is, this is the effect that allows the pitching blade, or, or allows the air to stick to a pitching blade and it's therefore the same effect that is causing the aeromine to uh, to not lose power when the wind's changing direction. This is going to be a really quick overview, but the this is just from the Wikipedia page, and it's a really good um, description of it. They've got these five images in a row, and the, the idea is you've got this jet here, um, and the jet of air starts to pull air in from around it. So you can imagine this jet is just the free wind blowing. It's called entrainment when the wind that's blowing, in this case the jet, is grabbing air from the side. If you then put in, surf in image two, if it's trying to grab the... Uh, I almost imagine it as the air molecules have arms that they're, they're grabbing in the um, air from either side. If you put a wall there, it will cause it to, in image three, pull itself towards the wall. So as the air is flying, it's grabbing things and it pulls itself towards the wall that you've placed there. Um, and that, if you continue doing it, even if you bend the surface, the, the wind will continue on round. So that's the the reason it can allow for di different your angles, but is 45 degrees either side enough? Possibly not, and I think they'd be very reluctant to put any moving parts on there. Patrick says, as a pilot, I see wind changing direction all the time during takeoff and landing, sometimes 180 degrees. Exactly. This is this is a great point. It it's just so often. In so many places, it will be more than 90 degrees. It, where I'm from, I should have windrows from relatively locally to me. And to be honest, to get, the, you could get a lot of the wind in a 90 degree profile from where I am, but it's famously, it, the, where I'm from is almost famous at how singular direction the wind comes from. We always have a southwesterly facing or dominant wind, and that 
is just not the case in the vast majority of places and I'm sure you've taken off and landed from a lot of different places and the, the chance of it all coming from the same direction is so small. So that's the rotating base. I think it would possibly benefit the, the product a lot but I don't think they're going to do it because the whole unique selling point is this um, not, not having any moving external moving parts. Okay, noise and vibration. This is the next one. Uh, I've, I'll do half of this one and probably leave the other half to the end because it's just a bit long-winded. Perhaps it might be a bit for for anyone that's interested in the in some the maths and physics behind it, but it might be a bit boring. Who knows? <laughs> the the noise and vibration. I've seen some people say, "Won't this uh, system be very loud?" I expect not because this obviously you've got the the fan you can be placing that possibly wherever you like not that there will be extents because when you have a fluid such as air going through a pipe you have uh, friction so as your air is going through the pipe it's got friction on the on the side so you're getting pipe losses or yeah the, the air is flowing slowing down losing energy as friction to the wall so you won't be able to place this fan wherever you want. Uh, it will be restricted to places that are near enough to your actual turbine. I don't know how they manage that. But you could insulate in the same way that in electric vehicles, the motor is of, often acoustically insulated. The chances are it could be the same here that you could have the wind turbine, or sorry, the, uh, the electric generator somewhere slightly away, not too far away. So you, you get lots of losses, um, but far enough away that with a bit of sound insulation, you wouldn't hear the, the noise or get vibrations. But I'd be interested to see what they do with that. Uh, the other thing is the actual vibrations of this on the roof, which is what some of the calculations were going to be for, which I'll do at the end. Um, the, the real danger with vibration is hitting resonant frequency. The best way of describing this is sort of, like pu pushing a swing, if, if you're pushing a swing, um, I'll, uh, ha I'm half reading a reply from Susie, I'll finish my point and then I'll get to it. The If you're pushing a swing, you, you always push the person on the swing so that it's as they come back, that's when you push them. So that is sort of the frequency of their spin, uh, sorry, the frequency of the swing is their frequency and you're trying to push them at the same frequency and that sort of hit, hits like a uh, a feedback kind of loop where it, the swing gets higher and higher whereas if you were to push them at random times in their swing or not push them at the same frequency as they're going at they would never really get very high so the um, yeah so so the the point being a real problem would, would be if they were hitting resonant frequency and there is this video uh, which I should be able to play which is a, a bridge that was designed without without this in mind basically and th what's happening is the bridge is like the swing and the wind coming from the side is is hitting the bridge at the same rate at which it's it's coming back so what happens is you've got this huge bridge and it just starts swaying and obviously all the cars have had to evacuate and someone had not done some calculations where the wind speed made the bridge hit its resonant frequency and it hit this big feedback loop and you can see this whole bridge going up and down this was one of the first <laughs> years of engineering at uni we got showed this and I thought it was a good example eventually oh god yeah look, look at that eventually it all just breaks so you definitely wouldn't want that with the air mine I don't think it would be uh, at risk of that because it would have a very high resonant frequency because it, it's so stiff in place but that that's an interesting point okay let me look at the comments to Patrick's point I really don't think that the picture of the current design uh, from the picture that it would take that much to place it on a rotating base. I agree Susie, I, I think it would be relatively simple 
the issue would be if they're pl one of the issues possibly uh, is that I'm thinking if they're trying to place these there was an image of this somewhere if they're trying to place these on the edge of some roofs this is not a good picture of it but you, you can see they're sort of located on the edge you might also have an issue where if they're rotating they're now trying to get wind from the other side of the building so imagine that instead of coming from left to right or whichever way around it is on the screen if the wind was now coming from the other direction and it rotated you're now getting a lot of slowing effects and a lot of drag and and just it would be very suboptimally placed so that would be one issue possibly with it being rotating is that you're now getting wind from places that is not um not as fast but also yeah i i think it's uh just possibly would undermine a lot of their points though the rotating base is a lot less of a maintenance issue than rotating or not issue a lot less of a maintenance burden than rotating blades so I, I i think it could have merit but i don't think it would be able to do full uh full rotations in some of the use cases that they put out just because it means that the wind will be coming in at the, at the wrong direction rumble jam says it's difficult to have a return on investment on this kind of technology it is uh i mean e even the most mature of these especially for domestic uses because the payback period of a lot of uh, household renewables and things like that, even like domestic solar, can be so long. Better now because of the uh, electricity prices are so high, but generally they've been so long that it's hard. Uh, people generally might not stay at their, their own house that long. So it, there's a lot of issues with getting financial return on these. That's why I think possibly we spoke about harsh climates earlier maybe the use case of this is very niche but in those you in those niche areas it does make sense um but I, I just don't think there'll be that many i don't think it'll be mass scale put it that way okay whole building designs this is a brief section but someone had left a comment i thought was interesting on the use of what i think they'd actually imagined is you'd have two towers that would be each of the aerofoils on this uh, design so you can imagine these these red uprights here on on the uh, picture are the actual building and then you would have vents within the building that would suck through a generator i think was the idea something i thought may be a problem here is that if you have two buildings that are designed to create low pressure between them, you, the buildings, excuse me, would want to pull themselves together almost. So you'd probably need some strong bracing. I'm not a civil engineer. I don't know how that would work. It probably wouldn't be that much of a problem, but I think you'd have such messy flow going between the two buildings. You might not quite get the low pressure regions you want anyway. And then forget about any rotating base as well. You'd be You'd be very stuck in. Okay, uh, back to Susie says, agreed that they're trying to take advantage of the pressure effect created by the building's surfaces and if the device was operating through 180 degrees, as you say, it would lose this benefit. Yeah, it, it's, it would possibly work better if it was in, take taken back to the Antarctica scenario, you could imagine that they've if, if it was placed in an open um, sort of snow field, I don't know what the word is, an open snow space that then then it could rotate and it wouldn't be affected as much uh, so maybe we're, we're kind of grasping at straws at where it is useful but I, I'm, I'm sure that the rotating base would work in places and maybe it could help uh, overall but on on the rooftop it, it might it might have trouble so with this building design the one that I had seen which I remember was this building which i can't actually remember what it is now so i do apologize but it's, it placed these wind turbines between the building and i think the idea was that it possibly symbolizes but also actually does generate renewable energy for these two buildings um which is in theory uh great but i think they had again a lot of issues with wind direction um 
meaning that these wind turbines never really got up to speed and from if my memory serves me correctly they actually ended up powering these wind turbines sending uh, electricity to them to make them spin because it looked so bad uh, on the building's engineers and the construction team and uh, whatever that it, it looked so bad because they were never spinning so they ended up using energy to spin them which is uh, a bit of a a bit of a ridiculous situation to be in it may not have 100 been this building but that that definitely happened somewhere okay patrick in the chat why are capture tubes at the front why not one long capture at the end where the wind is moving the fastest um so i'm thinking you're saying that the these tubes here i think that's correct what you're saying that they're at the front of the aerofoil but the wind is fastest at the back um i'll, I'll answer that question double, double check uh, and put in the chat whether that is what you meant if not we'll come back to it so the reason that these uh tubes are at the front of the wind turbine goes back to this image so Again, I think this this was uh, for wind speed, but the the pressure plot would be very similar. So these dark red areas would show, or is correlated to where the pressure regions are better or or worse, or higher or lower. So the reason that you want them nearer the front, uh, or yeah, a bit, bit further back than I've noted there, is because that's where the air is squeezed. So the air is actually going fastest right in the middle and that's due to sort of oh god Bernoulli's and sort of like a venturi tube uh, where if you're squeezing the airflow in uh, because it's got a smaller cross section it has to speed up to to go through it so at the back it's actually slowed down because there's the, the air is sort of expanded out and it's uh it, it's got it's got wider or a larger area to move through, so it's it it can go slower and still have the same volume of air moving. So I think that's why that's why it's at the front is because that's where the air is squeezed and that's where it's hitting the the maximum speed and the lowest pressure to get the the most amount of air drawn up through the generator. Okay. Another thing I'd seen which relates to what I'd mentioned in the video on the the use of this to sort of circulate fresh air into buildings which is very reminiscent of these wind catcher towers that we'd seen um, used in for many thousands of years uh, the point of these is that the the air from outside can be drawn in uh, using low pressure low pressure regions that form to, to sort of suck the, suck the air out and this is sort of like a quite a rudimentary or old school method of doing what the wind uh, or sorry what the air in mine is, is kind of doing so there was a more modern version of this I saw from a very quick search called mono drought which from some a paper I found which I believe was uh, from their team you could, if you sort of ignore the, the part A at the top, but on, on this second diagram, they've got the, got the airflow going over it. There's a high and low pressure region at the, the top and bottom of this sort of U-shaped thing on the top. Uh, one way or another, they, they've created a low pressure region and it seems to be drawing in fresh air. So someone is doing a sort of modern version of the of this wind catcher that, that has been around for so many years. So that that is on the horizon. And what I thought was interesting about this is in England, for example, in winter where we are now, the thought of flushing out the whole house with cold air is potentially quite troublesome uh, because we'd be, we'd be quite chilly so the something that they do in passive houses which are basically just extremely efficient 
extremely energy efficient homes, um, they use heat exchangers and maybe there's a way to incorporate these two together. So instead of just pumping in fresh but cold air and pumping out stale warm air, they go through a heat, ex heat exchanger with each other. So you, your warm, the, the warm air that's in your building is heating up the fresh air as it goes out. So you end up with, it won't be a, probably 100% efficient as obviously nothing is, but the, the not all of the energy you've used to heat up your building is just thrown out the window quite literally. It's instead used to warm some of that cool air coming in. So you get warmed um, fresh air. I haven't seen anyone using these two ideas, the passive house heat exchanger and the fresh air intake together, but I could definitely see that that working as an idea. Possibly wouldn't be too complex. Um, and the final point was just just ag again on the surface roughness, there was you've basically got roughness classes on the left here. And Depending on depending on what type of uh, landscape type you're in uh, here depends on your surface roughness. So th this makes you think where is the air mine going to be used, um, and w what effect does that have on on the wind speeds that the actual turbine is seeing? Because that's what it, what's important. Dragon King in the chat says, "What type of fusion reactor do you think will?" be the first one that actually connected to the grid generating electricity. I'm working on a video currently actually um, around why they haven't generated electricity from fusion reactors. Um, and it's quite interesting because in theory, the, it's relatively straightforward for something like a tokamak to take, to take out its energy from the fusion reaction. This is a side note, we'll get back to the main topic. Um, using the its own cooling system and ITER, one of the big fusion reactors to come, will have a massive cooling system which it could use and may use to generate some electricity, no useful amount of electricity um, and the reason why tokamaks generally are not producing electricity now is because it's not a research area that they need to um, really focus on as much, there's so many other bigger problems that the electricity generation isn't their prime concern therefore it could the, you could very well get electricity from a tokamak just it wouldn't it wouldn't be overly useful um, I think it will be something more like Helion's um, field reverse configuration reactor because they'll uh, be able to th that's a key part of their research testing if if they don't do it sooner rather than later it might be a problem whereas the tokamaks stellarators uh, even inertial confinement fusion, they, they generally are unlikely to have a problem with electricity generation. One of the guys I spoke to, um, one of the you know, fusion experts working at the Swiss National Labs, he says that it's interesting a lot of people think about the problems of getting electricity out, but the main problem in fusion science, fusion engineering, is keeping the energy in the plasma. So, uh, yeah. Still 30 years away, Patrick. Always, always 30 years away. We'll see. Um, yeah, I think electricity generation will happen relatively soon, but useful electricity electricity, electricity generation will be a long way away. Um, okay, sorry, that was a bit of a side note. Susie says, I have just such a HVAC system in my house and it works brilliantly, changing the total volume of air in the house every four hours. It's like having the windows open in summer. Highly recommended. Wow, I, I presume that's a... The heat exchanger one, is that what you're saying, Susie? That's, I've heard good things. Um, someone I know used to, or someone I used to know, had them in his house that he built and he uh, swore by it. And triple glazing, that was one of his uh, high recommendations. Okay, awesome. Um, the, yeah, the, the, this surface roughness, it, it wasn't, it's not the most interesting thing to look at, to be honest. But it's the the point of it is, if we take the wind speed that we have quoted in the Midwest, which is seven meters per second, 
if we put it into a calculator which says at 30 meters per second with no surface roughness which is this first column if we have seven meters per second you can see in all of these diff as the land gets more and more populated um, or the surface roughness gets higher and higher you can see how quickly it drops off so surface roughness of 0.1 which relates to just agricultural land drops the wind speed down to 5 meters per second at 30 meters which is probably higher than the aeromine system would be and if you start looking at cities over here we've got oh sorry I blocked some of the text there but large cities with tall building you have a roughness factor of 0.8 which would be in between the two here so you'd have less than 4 meters per second would be some in here they haven't actually got it on this one um, but you really start to lose your wind resource with buildings and things like that which was the point point to make there these are the same graphs from the video that I did but yeah that that the the key issue I think with the aeromine was that they didn't seem to have considered the effects of where they actually put the wind turbine it's um it's not it's, it's not as simple as as maybe the the wind speed graph uh, at the top here looks you've got to consider a lot of other things uh, okay that is the main point of the video uh, God okay this was the last thing that people had mentioned was would the wind speed basically rip the aeromine off of the the, the building um, because the the wind speed from the side uh, may just either rip it off or push it in a gale um, because obviously that these are a lot taller and and ha have potentially a lot more drag. Susie says roughness is a key issue, but not all roughness is negative. What what do you mean by that? that that's an interesting interesting point. Um, in the fact that it's good to have some surface roughness is that due to uh, you, ha you have to let me know on that what 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 the positives are because uh, perhaps maybe that's to do with the the way the airflow because I know if you've got for example different terrain you can get hill effects which are bare if, if the wind is blowing over over a, or if there's a hill and the wind is blowing towards it it can speed up over the hill so I don't know if that's um, characterized in roughness or not it may well be um, but yeah let, let me know what, what you were thinking on that Susie um, the the final thing I was going to do I've got some basic calculations here so we'll run through it um, if anyone is interested it yeah okay yeah so Su Susie says in city centers you can have dramatic acceleration effects between buildings yeah exactly okay that, that's why I was thinking with uh, the hill effect but instead of a hill if you had buildings it could act as uh, sort of t wind tunnels that's a great point actually I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of that um, though these wind tunnels will possibly be susceptible to wind direction as well sometimes there'll be really strong wind and sometimes they won't have any wind but that, that's a good point it, that will definitely change the profile of the wind and could be beneficial if, if you uh, play it. Turbulent air is less effective. Yeah, I'd imagine that you really want laminar flow going through the air airfoils to get max maximum left or maximum pressure differences. But I'm not not an expert on that. Uh, you probably know more as a pilot. So the the final thing was that if we look at the wind at the aeromine, if we imagine that there's a wind blowing from the side of it coming on from the side, uh, the question is how much force will there be trying to rip the the aeromine over trying to tip it and you can basically with a lot of oversimplification uh, you, you can say that if we imagine the aeromine turbine as it's 1.5 meters um, by 4 meters it has a surface area 
of six meters squared and I'll convert to any other units people need at the end. Um, and we can use this drag formula, formula at the top. So the coefficient of drag is a bit up for debate. What is the coefficient of drag of the aero mine from the side? Uh, I'm going to use one just in this example, which is kind of similar to this cube and this short cylinder. Um, the overall that will cause our the drag to equal 0 0.5 a half times the density of air which is 1.23 kilograms per meter cubed times our velocity and here I've got the a wind scale which sort of puts into perspective different wind speeds so we could say that maybe a, what, what would be the effect in a storm which is um, yeah, the, a storm is 30 meters per second. If we, oh, if we say that we've got uh, 30 meters per second, which is squared, times our one drag coefficient, times our six meters squared area, it ends up being, and now do I trust what I've got written here, or shall I? Retype that in. Um, what have we got? Thirty. Times six. Okay. Have I done that correctly? No. Times one point two. Yeah. Is roughly three thousand three hundred newtons, which is a bit of a an abstract number so if we're saying the wind there's if we're in a storm the wind is blowing to the side of the aero mine um, it's hitting it's getting 3300 newtons of force pushing it we could simplify we, we could give this a more easy uh, 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 yeah maybe a, a better example is that I'm pretty sure I worked out if we had a um, yeah, Patrick makes a great point. Another reason to turn it into the wind is so it not, doesn't not rip, rip off your roof. It's a great point. I, in a hurricane or a very heavy storm, I can't imagine you wouldn't be a bit worried about it. I, I think it would need some some way to lower its uh, lower its self or something like that. Okay, before I now give an example of what this three thousand three hundred newtons is. I'll quickly look back at the chat because yeah, the, the 3,300 newtons is a bit abstract. So Captain G says wind turbines are that shape, presumably. Uh, I, I presume you're talking about the a rotating turbine for a reason. See Bet's law. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure. You have, you might have to clarify there that. So Bet Bet's limit, um, perhaps what you're referring to is where you can only extract so much wind speed or so much power out of the wind because otherwise it'll be stagnant on the other side of the wind turbine um yeah i'm not sure if that's that what you're meaning referring to this so let me know um dragon king what fusion companies are you most excited for first light fusion commonwealth fusion systems lawrence uh hill livermore national laboratories or helion out of those to be honest i actually don't know loads about the first two uh, I've heard interesting things. The last, so uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, I think, is a very interesting facility, but I think, in my opinion, they might be more focused towards uh, nuclear defense and testing. I don't, I'll be, I don't think they've got as much focus on uh, nuclear fusion energy as the other ones, which is more my interest. So. Helion, out of those three, oh, sorry, out of those four, just because of what I know uh, or don't know about the first two, Helion seems really interesting. From what I understand, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, maybe that's the small superconducting one. I can't remember. But Helion's super interesting, and, and they, they're doing a lot more public talks now, um, which is which is nice. So I'm very excited to see what they do. I was very skeptical, well, not skeptical, but 
you, you've got to be skeptical of some of these things to start with, but it sounds super interesting the more I hear. Um, Susie says, the hill illustration is exactly correct. Sheeps do not like certain places in the field because they know where the wind flow is stronger and colder in these places. So they avoid them. That is interesting. Next time I see some sheep on a f hill, I'll have to see if they're avoiding the uh, the high velocity regions. That is, that is an interesting thing I've not thought of. Um, Frost family, why don't wind turbines change their angle or use blades uh, of their blades instead of use brakes? Brakes are for chance. So some of the some wind turbines will. So I think we presume we're talking about normal rotating wind turbines. Um, some of them you you can use brakes. These normally are used in emergencies, from my understanding, uh, to slow down the wind speed. But a lot of them will have your control, and they'll pitch the blades to make them less effective in high wind speeds to stop it spinning as much. Um, some of some of them will actually. Uh, so some of the wind turbines don't actually actively change their, their wind turbine blades. The blades change sort of automatically. They're passively, passive your control. Um, <laughs> Patrick, don't go putting any sheep on your roof. Um, okay, Dragon King, you just said back. I'm not, I, I gave a bit of a longer answer to your question. I'm not sure you may have missed it, but long story short, it, yeah. Helion out of those is most interesting, but largely because it's more what I know more about what they've done. And the Lawrence Livermore National Labs, I think, are more focused on nuclear testing and energy sec or yeah, security um, for the US in terms of weapons. Then th they're also interested in energy, I think, but I don't think it's their main focus uh, from the research I've seen. OK, now back to the final example. The. My example is going to be, if we have this 4 meter tall tower, we can say that it is the equivalent, if, if you imagine, this is potentially a bit abstract, a 110 kilogram or 220 pound woman or man um, running at the Aeromine system at a, a good jog pace, I think I have it down as 12 kilometers an hour, 3 meters per second, not sure how many miles an hour that is, not many, about eight. Um, if you have a 110 kilogram person running at the aeromine at uh, a good jog, maybe a, a bit of a run, and, and hitting into the side of the aeromine, given some assumptions, that is the same amount of force as the wind pushing on it in a storm. So say if you had a 30 meters per second gale or, or gust that blew at it, it would be the equivalent of a 110 kilogram person, 220 kilo, uh, pound person, jumping and hitting it at two meters or right in the middle. The reason that's the case, if we say force equals mass times acceleration, um, then force equals mass times acceleration. If we say the person that hits it takes 0.1 seconds, which seems reasonable from what I've read, to go from their full speed of three meters per second to stopped, that means they'll be decelerating at, is a negative 30 meters per second squared. So if they're, if they're taking a tenth of a second to go from three meters per second to zero meters per second, they've got a deceleration of 30 meters per second squared. If you times that by 110 kilograms, multiply that together you get 3,300 newtons um, so maybe that a, a very a significant human jogging and hitting the side of it would be what a storm would a gust of wind would would do so maybe that who knows maybe that puts into perspective for some of you what the uh, the the air in mind system might it might actually have Meters per second to miles per hour. Okay, perfect. Is that? Wow, well, I did not know that. So roughly 2.2. So, so that means that three meters per second would be six point, roughly 6.6 .6 miles an hour. Okay, awesome. Uh, Susie, do you know what airspeed they're suggesting to achieve five kilowatt output? I think um, that will be nine meters per second. 
So these the test here, where they got their maximum efficiency, was uh, a nine meters per second testing. <laughs> 110 kilogram person tends not to run. Maybe for long enough to to run into the air mine. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, nine meters per second. I, I think is their peak output for five kilowatts. But I'm not sure. That that's just judging on the test speeds that they've been doing, because their their tests their their peak performance is at nine meters per second. But it it might be at f here. They've got 15 meters per second. So it would be in that ballpark. It would be up there. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if it would have, normally with a wind turbine, a, a, a rotational wind turbine, the power goes up quite quickly and then plateaus, and that's generally due to limitations in the generator. Um, but maybe this, it, it might continue going all the way up until max speed of 30 meters per second or whatever it can handle. Uh, I, just, I imagine at high wind speeds as well, you'll be getting such strange air flows through it. It might not, you might not get nice low pressure regions so I, w I wonder as well if you're having quite gusty wind it might also disrupt dis disrupt the uh the power generation you can get from it okay awesome that has been all all i had planned so hopefully you, some of you watching patrick susie frost family dragon king robert captain g lois and yoris rumble jam all in the chat uh, very much appreciated, and I think Dilemma at the front, yeah, right, right at the start. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, that was the first live stream. Hopefully, over time, maybe I'll learn more about the process and what people get some feedback on what, what you guys expect or would like to see. Um, Frost Family, I hope that fusion can be used on the technology in the video, making synthetic fuel from seawater. I haven't seen that, but. Uh, I'll have to go and check that out now. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you for uh, your input. It's been been really good. Dragon King, please do more live streams. Yeah, the plan is, it might not be for every video, and I don't know what the time schedule will be, but over time, the the hope is to do some more live streams and get a bit of a um, uh, get get something going with that because it's been it's been nice to do some proper interaction. Generally, the the videos I produce are, uh, you know, any limited interaction with anyone so that it's been very positive thank you all very much for coming and uh well done and thank you i think this is incredibly interesting tech i agree susie it's all super interesting anything that comes out whether it's got limitations or not i, I always think it's worth sort of looking at because you can learn a lot from it um and also the chances are it will have some uses even if uh, maybe they're not clear or maybe they're more niche or whatever or maybe I'm completely wrong and things have uh, a breakthrough that allows them to be more mainstream awesome thank you very much all for watching and I've got a video coming out possibly tomorrow possibly the day after which is looking at the, the breakthrough to give some more context at the uh, National Ignition Facility where they just got a scientific Q value or the a gain of over one for the first time. So look out for that one and uh, thank you very much for coming.